Hey, welcome to the Road and Morale podcast. So do you ever feel like screaming out in the office, on Zoom or outside the school gates, for the love of God, come on, really? Then if this is you and you're looking for an honest, fun and frank podcast on life and business, then sit back and listen to me, Rona Morel. I'll be bringing great people on the show to talk, share and debate their life experiences and business challenges, keeping the show unpolished, but in a fun and unique British style with sarcasm, tenacity, maybe a few swear words or tears. This podcast keeps it real, honest, raw and removes the bullshit in the only way I know how, through authenticity and getting shit done. Think of it less like the Housewives of New York or TOWIE with the lipo and drama and more like the house lives of the real world. I hope you'll take something away to be better informed laugh, smile, or maybe even finally get in the confidence to shout, come on, really. So enjoy. Hi, Erica. Welcome to the Rona Morel podcast. How are you? Thanks, Rhonda. Hi, I'm good. Good. Excited to be here. Excellent. So, uh, oh, I'm just kicking bins under my desk. Um, So for the listeners, I'm delighted to welcome Erica uh, Valzarelli, uh, who's based in Singapore um, and has been a thought leader in agriculture. Um, You've been an um, ex-marketeer, entrepreneur, and you've also studied and hold an MBA and an MPA from Harvard University. So kudos to you. Um, I know that you've worked all across Europe, Asia and Africa, and your passion very much is around developing and implementing impactful projects in climate change uh, with a focus on smallholder um, farmers. Um, And I know in 2021, you formed the Sustainable Smallholder uh, Group, and we'll talk about that today. But what we're going to talk about mostly is a lot of what's going on in the world right now about hybrid moving um, regen agriculture. And I'd also love to get your thoughts on, you know, kind of what's going on in with Dutch farmers and Sri Lankan farmers right now and, and, and the impacts of that. So welcome to the show, Erica. And um, let's dive straight in and start talking about this, you know, what these impactful projects are and how you're implementing them and, and helping Mother Earth. Um, yeah, so the sustainable smallholder basically works with uh, organiz- solely works, I should say, with organizations that have at the core uh, the transition for smallholder farmers to sustainable systems. Sustainable defined as socially sustainable, economically sustainable, and environmentally sustainable. And especially within smallholder context, it's really important because one is so much correlated to the other. So in other words, if there is not an economic benefit for the farmer to change practices, a smaller farmer doesn't have the bandwidth to take that risk, for example. Sure. Um, and and some of the, 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 um, the projects that we work on go from regenerative coconut production in Thailand, um, working with the likes of uh, Danone, for example, to uh, empowering women farmers in the Congo and in Rwanda on coffee farming um, with sustainable practices, obviously, to uh, sustainable rice farming in Vietnam and how to further educate farmers to shifting towards these practices. Amazing. And so I guess one of the biggest misconceptions or challenges, I guess, is I can't move to sustainable. I can't, I can't not use fertilizers. How are you approaching that topic? Yeah, that is actually a really good question. I get asked that a lot. So when you look at certain concepts and the way certain uh, organizations define those, so take regenerative agriculture, certain organizations define regenerative agriculture as an, uh, as an approach whereby the use of pesticides or even hybrid seeds and synthetic fertilizers is not allowed. Whereas other people define regenerative agriculture in a, I would almost say softer way, whereby it is important to minimize 
uh, the use of, for example, synthetic fertilizers uh, in order to increase soil health and soil fertility. So I've taken that example because personally and with, with the Sustainable Smallholder Organization, uh, we actually believe in a softer approach when it comes to transitioning smallholder farmers. And the reason is very simple, is because the smallholder farmer doesn't have the information, neither the knowledge, neither the financial bandwidth, and neither the uh, appropriate behavior, I would say, to shift from one season of conventional farming to another season of regenerative farming. The risks are too big. And so the way I have seen things work is a journey of transition, whereby, for example, synthetic fertilizers are still used, but they're used less. And they're compensating by, for example, manure or making our own compost that is made by, by the farmers. Or overall, if the soil after three to four seasons is healthier, then by itself, you do not have to use as many synthetic fertilizers. No, of course. And I think there's, there's such a big um, task at hand, isn't there, with the global chemical fertilizers? It's a bit like sort of big oil and pharmaceutical and, and equally that, you know, drugs cartels. It's such a huge industry and the information and the lobbying that comes out from those large companies. So I think it's really great that it's a little bit hand-holding, hybrid and transitional because like you say, they don't have the scale or infrastructure to be able to just turn things. And I think that's probably some of the challenges that's going on in Sri Lanka right now is that they've tried to do a hard stop, haven't they? And that's, yes, uh, Rana, that's exactly it. So what they, the movement was already uh, in the work since, since five, six years. Uh, but then they did a hard stop about uh, three years back, if, if I remember correctly they shifted to fully organic, uh, which is also debatable what that means, fully organic. But within RISE, for example, I know that fully organic truly meant no synthetic fertilizers, no hybrid seeds even, and no pesticides whatsoever. Um, they, the, the economic or the business case, I should say, and the economic assumptions behind it were that, yes, the yield would be impacted short term, but because of the price premiums on the market, for example, for sustainable rice, as, as um, certified by, for example, the sustainable rice platform standards, they would get premiums in the market. But as, as, as usually happens, uh, when you are dependent on premiums, you're dependent on consumer behavior. And when there are things such as high oil prices, prices of food increasing, especially now with the Ukraine crisis and everything as such, consumers, um, the first thing they actually stop spending on is those type of premium products. And they go back to, if you want to call it, uh, normal rice or normal wheat products and so forth. Yeah. And that is actually what happened in, in Sri Lanka. Um, they didn't get enough premiums and the yields went down much more than they had uh, anticipated. And at the same time, what happened is the government was not well equipped to actually um, put money and resources and the agronomy extension service um, to have them ready to actually transition the farmers towards other, let's call them sustainable practices, whether these are regenerative, climate smart, whatever you want to call them. Actually, that was not there, not enough. And that is what, what happened and has been part of the I would say has been a big influencer within the yeah. um, economic and political collapse of the country. Because some of the basics of food, um, especially when it comes to wheat, bread, rice, all of those things, it's been really interesting even here in the UK. You know, they haven't gone up 5 11% with inflation. They've gone up 120%. And so even what you would call your staple foods to sustain, you know, life are so ridiculously high that as, as you say that people are going down the kind of shopping eye line to, to to the very basics and of course that isn't a premium price yeah yeah so in terms of um helping so let's say i'm a small um farmer and 
how do you look at it from a social point of view when you look at kind of um, sustainability? What sort of practices do you help them to embrace? Yeah. So if you look at, so there are a couple of thoughts here I would like to share. So if you look at um, the rural communities smallholder farmers belong to, live in, say the village, it's already by itself extremely complex because what is happening is that you have tribal leaders, village leaders, you have farmers that are more influential than others. And those don't need to be the bigger farmers, don't need to be the one with five hectares. It can be sometimes the one with half an hectare. Kind of, for example, in India, it has to do with the caste system and so forth. So these, um, these systems are extremely complex. And many times when uh, communities or even individual farmers want to shift practices that are different from the legacy of the community, they're having a hard time because many times the change needs to come from these village leaders. Yeah. And many times these village leaders are relatively traditional. And so that, that is already one bottleneck. And you see actually that NGOs are starting to understand that and starting to influence them and train these leaders or these influencers first. And then you will have a ripple off effect towards the entire community. But when I talk about social sustainability, I actually talk about equitable food systems where, for example, women are as much as empowered and taken into consideration and equipped with transition finance and equipped with the right knowledge and information as milk farmers. I'm also talking about equitable food systems uh, in regards to aging populations, especially here in ASEAN uh, yeah. or Japan. Uh, what you see is that the average uh, farmer age is about uh, 62. Uh, wow. And so, yeah, so the, the big question uh, really is, who is going to take over my farm? And especially now with COVID, that. yeah, especially now with COVID, what you could have seen is that a lot of, uh, okay, even if some countries have hit the break on urbanization, but so that is such a big trend. And so all the youth has gone to, to the cities. And so that makes the problem even worse. I, because farming is not sexy. Everybody knows that, especially rice farming, is a backbreaking job. And so yeah. who wants to farm these days? And so that is a huge issue. So the social part of sustainability is really finding inclusive business models. It sounds really fancy, but what we mean is business models whereby there is gender equity. Business model whereby actually the youth is included. So, for example, now you see a lot of upcoming models where startups that work with entrepreneurs that basically start training the youth in these villages or in these communities to actually become the face of that startup, for example. Yeah. Um, because when you talk about training farmers, you cannot do that through an app when it comes to small farmers. So that's how these, for example, these youth entrepreneurs are being trained. And so I would say these are kind of the facets that we need to very much think about when we talk about social sustainability in the context mm. of smaller farming. And so are there any sort of particular areas that the youth are really embracing, you know, kind of stopping the desire to go to the big cities and maybe realising an opportunity that they may have and seeing, a, a, you know, kind of a longevity in it? Yeah. Um, yes, to a certain degree. And we need to do much, much more to actually exactly skill that effect because that is what we want. We want either the youth to come back or we want the youth to stay for various reasons. <clears throat> the youth nowadays is, is much more prone to take up new technology, to take yeah. up innovation, to take up digital solutions. A 61-year-old farmer has got a, a bigger, um, I would say, challenge with having his farm sprayed by a drone versus a 25 year old who thinks it's cool and who exactly sees why that is important or yeah. receiving information or nudges of information through an app it's easier for a 25 year old than for a 61 year old again on average without you know trying to discriminate yes. here uh, and so you you see already that a lot of uh, new business models driving by startups um, in, for example, India, 
they have a lot of success and actually youth is going back because they see it as a profitable business opportunity. So that's the whole point. Farming needs to become sexy again and profitable. And yeah. you can only do that with new technology. Even within regenerative farming, it doesn't have to be conventional, but new technology, new, more efficient methods of farming need to be at the core. So you start seeing that youth is picking that up. You start seeing that it's becoming a very big trend. Uh, there are a lot of startups that, uh, you know, just gain, the half is one of them, just gain another 100 million of Series C uh, money, whereby they do everything through youth entrepreneurs. And so right. these young fellows are coming back to the villages in Punjab, for example, and are starting their own, their own business. So that's just a fantastic example of, you know, of how it really can work. But again, we need more of this. And, and how are the smallholders that, you know, that you're dealing with coping with this exponential rise in fertilizer costs? Are they now starting to see that actually as we drive more health in the soils and we need less, that that in itself is the obvious benefit. I mean, for some farmers, they can probably afford one bag and and that's literally, and I've, I've heard stories of it being stolen and have to have it hidden. How are they coping? Yeah. Um, so I was recently in the field, I was in Cambodia and I was asking them the same question, but actually I didn't even have to ask them the question. It came up immediately. Uh, so prices have quadrupled in six months, quadruple. So smallholders were already having an issue with finding enough money to buy fertilizers. Uh, so imagine now, so what is happening actually, you see a lot of land that is uh, idle. So they stopped, uh, they stopped uh, working their land just because they didn't, uh, they didn't have the money. Uh, suicide rates are going up because yeah. you always actually see that it's extremely sad. You see that there is a huge correlation of uh, small so smallholder farmer suicidal rates and oil prices and fertilizer prices. Um, and basically they're not able to cope. Uh, yeah. That, is, that yeah. is the short answer. And so you see a lot of uh, NGOs that are actually uh, coming to the rescue. But they cannot come with fertilizer because there is a shortage. So, so what you see is that what, I, what is accelerating at the moment is the training on practices such as what you were alluding to, make your own composting practices, manure. Yeah. So, for example, you see a lot of NGOs giving ducks away to farmers so that farmers can start doing duck rice rotation, which is, by the way, uh, very successful. Uh, in India as well, we see that a lot of farmers are taking up um, um, a concept that is called uh, zero budget natural farming, where right. basically they can make their own um, they can make their own fertilizer using cow dung and cow urine and, and certain other uh, materials, which, yeah. by the way, work really well. And um and are, are are good for the soil uh, at the same time um so all of this is kind of in a way reassuring because what is happening is it's accelerating the transition that we are talking about in the beginning yeah. however it's still very sad and very complex because what is happening is that um this was not well planned for and so government extension services are not ready to help or they, they, they not because they don't want to but because it was unplanned it was right. not in the resource planning. Um, yields are still dropping. Uh, that is why in APEC they are expecting a food security crisis, especially on rice. Uh, right. So you see other institutes like ERI, for example, that is trying to help with uh, with giving away hybrid seeds to government. So Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh uh, is uh, is on a brink of a food security issue, and has just signed, for example, a, a contract with the ERI. That's the rice, the, Re the International Research Rice Institute, uh, on receiving uh, hybrids with climate smart varieties, and that means they need less fertilizer. So right. there are different ways to mitigate. However, because it was unplanned, and as we talked about, you cannot just shift to zero fertilizer at once. Yields are starting to go down, yeah. and uh, governments are fearing that. Um, 
are fearing the worst, basically. Yeah. And so for some of those communities that have got the elders and the people who are in their 60s and 70s, are they able to kind of give their wisdom for what farming was like even before fertilizers came along do they remember the days where they could produce using natural fertilizers um and how's that conversation and you know because we don't want to lose that knowledge um and let's be honest it's very traditional so yeah yeah that's actually a, a fantastic comment so um Yes, farmers, the older farmers still remember those days. Uh, And they even remember the transition from the Green Revolution onwards. So what happened in terms of seeds and and fertilizer. And actually, when you look at uh, regenerative practices or climate smart practices, all these practices are actually not innovative at all. To your point, those are practices that indigenously, they were yeah. already using. Uh, when you go to Latin America, for example, smaller farmers um, at the moment, there is a trend that they are talking back, they're talking with their elders because their elders actually can teach regenerative farming because it's just, you know, these older practices. Now, the challenge that we have is how do we, in a way, go back to these practices, but not but as well integrate innovative technologies with these practices. So we don't want to go back to prehistoric times, if you will, from a farming perspective, yeah. because we know what the challenges ahead are, especially in terms of how much more food we need to produce with less land, especially you know if we want to protect our forests and other mm. land under conservation. So the big challenge that we have ahead, and at the same time, the big opportunities, How do you actually go back to these indigenous practices? How do you further co-create with the farmer? Because it's the farmer who knows. Yeah. And how do you then co-create with them? How do you integrate these newer technologies such as drones, such as other mechanization tools, such as biostimulants, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, such as hybrid seeds with climate smart traits. How do you integrate these? And coming back to your first question of the podcast, that is that integrated system that I was alluding to. Yeah. And are you able to put a figure on global small holdings and how much they're responsible for global food production? Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. Actually, I was writing an article this morning, so I've got the calculations <laughs> fresh in my mind. Perfect. So there are... <laughs> There are 520 million smaller farmers worldwide. Smaller farmer defined as a farmer with less than two hectare of land holding. Okay. We also know that between 23 and 30 percent uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, global greenhouse gas emissions, 23 percent is caused by agriculture. And we know that 11 percent out of that 23 percent is through smallholder farmers. Mm-hmm. So it's it's actually it's it's a very it's a very big amount. For a smaller farmer, obviously it's lower, but because the smaller farm in the end, you know, there are 520 million smallholder farmers yeah. out of a population of only like 700 million farmers in the world. Uh, right. So it's it's the, from a volume perspective, it's it's, uh, it's big enough, and that again is the challenge because you know it's a very big part from a climate change perspective that needs to be solved, but because there are 520 million of them and they're so remote and they're yeah. so uh, unable to get access to the right information, how yeah. do you scale? No, absolutely. And, and how do you find the challenge? You know, I, 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 I look at England and I, I think, well, we were the Amazon not so long ago and we've chopped it all down and we've got farms absolutely everywhere. So there's a lot of pressure now on those countries that have got land left and, you know, taking out our biodiversity and land. How, how much pressure is on those small holders to, not grow in in size and space um yeah 
yeah. versus that that challenge with our biodiversity loss yes so in, in some countries it's bigger than others in in asia um however from an average perspective i would say that it's so when you talk about decreasing deforestation and deforestation in asia is because of uh increased farmland yeah it's now top top priority for governments. Every time you go to, uh, especially after COP26, by the way. So every time you hear the Minister of Ag or the Prime Minister speaks, deforestation uh, and and stop of biodiversity loss, it's, it's top of the agenda, which is new because you wouldn't hear this five years back. Yeah. Um, on the other hand though, it, it's also interesting to know that what is happening is a farmland is it is increasing but what is happening is there is a lot of consolidation happening at the same time mm. at the farmer level so what which is actually a good thing in a way what you see is that land sizes are getting uh, land holdings i should say are getting bigger right so a lot of farmers because of age or because they don't know who, who else you know can take over the business which are the more negative reasons i should say but other the, the more positive reasons is what you see is the big farm the big farmers are starting to consolidate to buy the farmers out which is actually not a bad thing at all and so what you see especially in china for example this is a huge trend so average sizes have gone up to 50 100 100 hectare farms right. without and and so what is nice is that then gives uh, gives space to having more intensive farming still mm -hmm. from a sustainable perspective though but because the land is as well congruent you can mechanize you know you can be much more efficient in the way you land uh, in, way, in the way you farm so from an economic and environmental perspective it's much better and at the same time, it kind of starts stopping deforestation because you don't need more land because what you're doing is you do more from less. You do more from the same amount of land. Uh, so, so what you see is governments are starting to put policies actually in place to increase this consolidation effort. Yes. So how does that then leave the existing farmer? So he's probably thinking, I'm just going to sell out. And it's a one lump sum. I mean, that in itself isn't sustainable. Or are they buying up the land and then still employing those existing farmers to help work the land? It depends. I've, I've, seen, I've seen both happen. Uh, I've seen uh, farmers being bought out. Um, and having enough actually to to live a good uh, a good um, uh, good an, an end of life, if you will, because these farmers are usually older. Uh, I've seen as well the negative side of it. I've seen, uh, especially in some parts of China, uh, the small farming being bought out for uh, for uh, not such a good amount of money. Uh, and now these farmers have gone to the city and, and back into kind of labor jobs, daily labor jobs. I know the government is trying to put policies around that to protect that from, or yeah. to prevent that from, from happening as much as possible. Um, and, um, and I've also seen whereby the big land owner, if you will, still employs the, the farmers because okay this person who usually is a man um will not farm by itself so this person yeah. still needs uh, he still needs some laborers and many times it's 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 the farmer and yeah. um, what's your view on companies that are looking to produce natural fertilizers and take on the chemical fertilizer industry you know rock powder there's um, the, the, like yeah, you say, various yeah. technologies, but ultimately using what is um, existing waste from one place, adding a bit more waste and creating a, an incredible fertilizer. So what's your yeah. hopes and dreams for the supply of, of, of those products? Yes, um, I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, I was just reading an article about the amount of uh, funding, actually global uh, venture capital funding that these um, uh, green uh, green fertilizer startups are receiving. So you're seeing like 
different you, you see different uh, technologies from uh, waste turn into uh, fertilizer uh, for example even rice uh, rice uh, mulched into fertilizer to a microalgae which yeah. uh, is extremely powerful and again there as well it's a bit borderline because where are these algae taken from so we need to be careful that you know we don't get into a new unsustainable method uh, but overall um, I personally think it is the future uh, mm -hmm. because uh, keeping mining for uh, potassium uh, is um, nitrogen is, 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 is not a story. You can even make nitrogen out of air and new technologies have started to surface out of that. But it's, it's mainly potassium, which is a, which is a really big, uh, big issue. Uh, those are finite resources. Yeah. Uh, the mining is extremely unsustainable. It's causing a lot of uh, emissions as well and a lot of social issues as well on top of it. So I personally believe it's the future. And I, and I really believe that, and I, my, my dream to your question is that more and more governments will actually start to collaborate with these companies, and actually start to put transition plans in place and that their agronomy extension services are also, you know, um, gonna inform and educate yeah. the farmers on these new services and that they do not only leave the private sector with this task but they would work actually together with the private sector in order to do that um, that is yeah. my my hope no and I'm, I'm i'm currently um not not working with but in communication with a fantastic guy in california who effectively has this amazing you know, sort of patent to take the billions of tons of mining waste that's just lying there. And, and it really is a simple process. You know, it is taking that waste, it's extracting the dangerous metals, it's injecting loads of food waste from fruit farms and almonds and vineyards, you name it. I mean, there's so much waste that we can use to make a product that ultimately can cost less than the price of fertilizer, even before it tripled in cost. So there is some really exciting space that gives me hope that, as you say, we can get the VCs um, behind it, we get the governments behind it, and, and ultimately scale and the education. So yeah, it, it certainly gives me a lot of hope. Me too, me too. And actually, that is something that the sustainable smallholder is working on. So I'm working with a lot of startups, actually, and as well with VCs, in order to actually facilitate that dialogue um, and show proof of concept of, of some of these technologies and business models. Once the proof of concept is there, it's human behavior. Everybody wants to be part of the success. So then it will kind of, I wouldn't say skill by itself, but it definitely makes it easier. Yeah, and I think if you can produce a product that's ultimately created from waste, it's a no-brainer in itself, you know, the simplicity of it. And so, yeah, it, it's it's hugely exciting, you know, and I've seen some of the technology with the drones and the the tractors, which aren't appropriate for small holdings, of course, but at larger scale, certainly the tractors with pinpoint precision. Right. Um, the drone technology is incredible. But like you say, imagining, you know, my father-in-law at 70 odd um you know <laughs> trying to navigate a drone over his farm you know so but like you say it is that push of that next generation um to have that knowledge and empowerment of the opportunity um because as you say the land is so precious we 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 get a lot of false information about we have to feed the world but as we know a third of all food produced is wasted so if we could cut even that inefficiency, we can feed up to 11 billion people straight away. Yeah. And it's not only the, the food waste itself. This as well, like if you look at uh, farming, there is a lot of uh, crop waste as well from the plant, from the land, the land preparation stage to the, to the planting stage, to the vegetable stage of the crop. There's a lot of waste there as well. I'll talk about weeds, talk about leaves, uh, talk about when you harvest a crop. And actually what is really interesting is that um, we have never considered the byproducts. So waste is actually a byproduct, but there are so many other byproducts that are not yeah. waste that can be turned into opportunities. So 
So for example, with this NGO in, uh, in Rwanda, we're working on, on the, the coffee. So when you depop coffee in order to roast yeah. it, to make the coffee as we know it, there is uh, the, the green um, shell, if husk. you will, that yeah. becomes the husk, exactly, that becomes, you can make that into a pulp. And that can become cascara, which is almost like a kombucha drink, for example. Yeah. Um, with old coffee, uh, coffee that we already have used uh, for one cycle, it's actually a fantastic fertilizer. Exactly. Especially in high acidic soils. So it's very nice to see how the circular economy concept has actually then given way for all these waste slash byproducts um uh opportunities to rise exactly and, and, and it's not about being idealistic and going back to prehistoric ways but it is using and scaling up that indigenous knowledge um you know the fact that coffee companies here go oh we're going to collect our coffee and we're going to do this and this well, again nothing new we know this you should have been doing it for years so Listen, I could talk to you about this all day. I'm, I'm really intrigued and I, I'm, I'm, I, it gives me hope every time I speak to people like you who are focusing on this and, and helping the, the majority versus the, the few billionaires that control kind of what's going on. So just final thought with you um, for any of the listeners out there, anyone interested in knowing more about this, um, what's your sort of hope for the future and then what can people do to help? Could you repeat the question, Rhonda? The last question I didn't hear well. I'm sure, no problem. So really just wanted to know what your hopes are. And then for anybody listening, is there anything they can do to help? Mm. So my hopes is that the, the voice of the smallholder farmer is going to be much more heard than today. In other words, every time we speak about an innovation for small the farmers, or we have a problem. Why don't we go out and listen to the smallholders, involve them and co-create with them? For yeah. some, it sounds ironic because they think that that's not possible. Actually, it's very much possible because it's them who know a lot about the land, the crop, and many of them still have that indigenous knowledge that you were referring to. And yeah. many other ideas because they have been farming since 30, 40, 50 years. And before that, legacies and legacies of families before. So for me, the hope is, is that the same way Europe is involving big farmers and big farmer associations in crafting policies, I hope that more and more of that is going to happen with the FAO, the UNDPs, other and other organizations working with smallholder farmers. I think that is not done enough at the moment. And that is, by yeah. the way, one part of, of the of, of, of part of my platform. And what can people do to help? People can exactly do that to help. They can they can raise that as one of I think the transformational aspects of how can we how can we work better with small the farmers? How can we bring innovation to small the farmers? Well, raise the point, get your feet dirty, go and speak to these farmers, yeah. listen to them, tell governments or in whatever job you are, the private sector, tell them to, to take a trip to the field. And already after having spent two days with them, you will see that already that is part of the solution. The solution will already yeah. be there. Amazing. I love that. It's it's about, you know, get your feet dirty and just spend a day with a farmer, like literally side Absolutely. by side. Absolutely. <laughs> I will definitely yes. do that. I have to, I actually, to be fair, I have done that and um, have been in very remote, remote um, parts of the world. So listen, Erica, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been incredible to talk to you and learn more about the sustainable um, smallholder company that you've set up and what you're doing. So kudos. Thank you. And I wish you every single bit of success. Thank you very much, Ron. It has been a pleasure and I feel honored that, uh, that you wanted to speak to, to me and, uh, and, and learn more about the sustainable smallholder. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's it. You've made it. The show's over. Thank you for being with us. I hope you've been able to take something away, maybe solve a problem or just know you're not alone. Here's hoping it made you smile with a few laughs along the way. Please feel free to find me on all social media channels and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just search the Rodin Morale podcast. Have an awesome day and see you next time.